Hello and welcome to Health Tech Hour on UK Health Radio, the world's largest and best talk health radio. My name is Steve Roos and each week we bring you the best news, views and interviews with the leaders, clinicians, CEOs and founders who are driving the health tech revolution in the UK and beyond. I am a CEO and founder of a health tech company myself and I am passionate, as all the listeners know, I am passionate about the people and companies who are changing the world. Before we start today's show, as always, we get to do a little bit of business. I'd like to remind all the listeners to follow us on at Health Tech Hour and follow the station, which is at UK Health Radio on the socials to stay on top of all of the great content that we've got coming up on this show and on all of the other shows across the station. So I actually look back um, across the last, you know, across the, the time we've been on air. And I think that this is actually our 30th show or something like our 30th show. There's a little bit of an issue in the record keeping. But yeah, I think it's the 30th, which is an incredible milestone. Um, thanks to all of our guests that have come on before. And thank you, obviously, to everyone for listening. And thank you also to my producers um, who help us, uh, help me put the show together and put such great content on air every single week. So today's guest is Dr. Jay Verma, who is a practicing GP in Northwest London, where he and his team have won many awards for the standard of care that they provide across a number of diseases. He is an expert in the use of digital technology in the transformation of primary care, uh, when primary care system being the GP system that we're so familiar with. Um, and um, that transformation is obviously to the benefit of patients. Jay is also the medical director of Medloop, which is a leading health tech company scaling rapidly across the NHS across the UK, uh, which focuses on making communication between patients and clinicians easier, which means people get the care that they need more quickly. Jay is also a fervent campaigner for equal access to healthcare, um, which is often called addressing healthcare inequality um, within the, the healthcare system. And what Medloop are doing is really at the forefront of addressing this health inequality and making healthcare access um, equal for, for everybody. So I know that the subject of improving communication sounds a bit generic, but Dr. Jay is going to enlighten us across the show uh, and make it clear to all of us exactly why um, better communication is critical and why we should all care about this in terms of the, the level of treatment and the quality of treatment that we can get. So Jay, how are you? Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me uh, on the show, um, Steve. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the very uh, explicit detail about my background, but I doubt it, uh, most of it is true. Was it, um, well, yeah, I mean, it was based on what you gave us. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, True, true, true. Partial of it. Um, okay. But yeah, um, so uh, where should we start? I mean, I, I guess uh, we, I've been working for Medloop for the last year now. And we're rapidly making vast improvements across uh, many health tech fronts, especially about delivering the uh, clinical services to our practices and eventually the patients. And um, yeah, but, but yeah. otherwise than that, yeah. Well, look, we'll, we'll get into all of that, don't worry. So as regular listeners know, the show's in three parts. The first part is all about the origins around how you came to be doing all of the amazing stuff that you're doing. The middle part is about all of the great, amazing stuff you're doing to change the world. And the final bit is really around the future for you and for the, for the company that, that you're advising and that you're working with. So um, before I ask everyone on the show, obviously the last 18 months to two years has been kind of obviously unprecedented. Um, we're about to go into what could be kind of a tricky winter. And, um, you know, so what's the mood in the camp, particularly at Medloop at the moment, oh, and also in, in your GP surgery, which gives you a unique insight yeah. given that you're, you know, you're a practicing GP at an award-winning um, GP, you know, clinic with, with all the, the fantastic treatment that you give, as well as being involved in, you know, in a, in a, in a health tech startup. So yeah, what, what's the kind of mood in the camp like? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, well, ch yeah, challenging is to probably, uh, challenging, I think is probably an over-optimistic word to use, even in this context, because it has been really pressing times, especially uh, with workforce numbers reducing in primary care. And I'm, I'm not just talking about the GPs, I'm just thinking about even of our uh, administrative staff who do so much mm -hmm. uh, for patients behind the scenes, and they're getting exhausted, stressed, um, and the workload is surmounting. And um, I mean, only uh, you might have read in the papers, that about 500 GP partners had left their roles in the last year. To I didn't June know that. That's, that seems like quite a high number. 
Oh, yeah, so I mean, it's about a drop about 3%, I think. And so that's really impacted primary care. The morale as well. So if the morale is down, then naturally, even whatever you have your strong, ardent, uh, you know, workforce, even they start to um, they depreciate in what their clinical capacity is like. Mm. So, um, but it's, I, I, but to be fair, it's, it's, it's tough. But I, I, I think people are soldiering on. Mm-hmm. I'm just worried about how long can we soldier on. And this is where health tech can really be a strong advantage in yeah. all of this and uh, ensure that patients aren't, um, uh, are, aren't uh, losing out in any way. Yeah, and I think that that's obviously a key theme across quite a few of the guests that we've had on over the last you know, nearly a year is that you know, there are certain areas of the system that are under a huge amount of pressure. and actually there are innovators, innovative companies that are trying to solve or at least help resolve some of those issues. Um, you know, nothing's necessarily a silver bullet, but, but by looking towards digital technologies, which is something we'll come into, because I know that you're obviously a huge proponent of that, that can actually alleviate some of the, if it's done right, it can alleviate some of the, the issues. It's not, not a complete solution, but it's sort of an all hands to the pumps moment. So um, but we can come on to that as we get through the show. So as I said, the first bit is around the origins. So mm. um, h- how and when did you did you realize that you wanted to work in healthcare and that you wanted to become a doctor? Like when did that sort of um, yeah. epiphany happen? Sure. Uh, so, um, oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I'll be candid about this because uh, I'm sure you probably appreciate more honest answers than anything else. So, um, coming from an Asian background, it's typically seen that you must be entering into healthcare. Okay. Uh, and uh, and it started off from there, but then later on, you realise that there is something to it. Not necessarily so much. I mean, most of the Asian mentality is very much more about the prestige it brings. But for me, yeah. it was more about making sure that I'm doing something worthwhile with my time, okay. about and adding benefit to uh, to society as a whole and um i think the first the probably most poignant moment was in year one of medical school when we swore the hippocratic oath and for me when you've sworn an oath that's 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 ingrained Mm. and i realized okay i this is where i am and i must follow suit and i did i started to love medicine as a result of a a medical school i was up in uh, aberdeen uh, very cold it's called the coldest and oldest university is that, what, uh, is that what they say? <laughs> yeah, because apparently uh, it started off in the 15th century by a monk, I think. And uh, so, so I bet it was so, cold. In, I bet it was cold up there in the 15th century. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, and it was. And I remember my first year of going to lectures, and it was a blizzard. I kid you not, it was literally a blizzard. I had to get through uh, to the medical school halls for my lecture, which of course I was late. Mm. Uh, for anyhow and um, I think it started off then and it was I've always even before that though I've always had a passion for technology I remember learning to code in Pascal and and it was always on the back of my head but it never really clicked thinking that could computing and medicine sort of interconnect and uh, although I entered medical school, I thought, well, OK, I better bury my desires for uh, clinical coding or, or, you know, or programming or any of that sort. And then um, as medical school uh, was finishing, I, I started to look at into more teaching. I love to teach um, because I realized that, A, I enjoy sharing knowledge. And, but more importantly, if we are trying to strengthen a workforce or I call it a create an army of uh, clinicians, um, then you've got to share the knowledge. Mm. And so in doing so, you get, and it will have a ripple or domino effect and they will eventually share their knowledge. And, um, and that's, that's, that's more or less of medical school. So. Okay. And then from there, what was your journey like to becoming a sort of practicing GP? Was that something that you, you automatically latched onto or, or was it did it take a while to get to 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 that being where you wanted to end up yeah that's 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 actually um so i actually was training to be an orthopedic surgeon okay and i did a year of research in stem cells 
uh, which you can see I'm hardly using at all in primary care now. I mean, it's not uh, quite, maybe, maybe in like 10 or 15 years, we'll all be having like stem cell injections in primary care, but it's probably, I don't know if it, that's a recommended therapy right now in, in the GP surgery. Well, and, and actually that was my, uh, my dissertation on uh, is, um, injecting chondrocyte uh, into right. knees, uh, arthritic okay. knees. And, um, and so, so I was all geared for a career in orthopedic surgery and uh, I had cleared my exams. I had a training number set. And then yet again, another uh, poignant moment, um, I just got married and uh, my wife and I discussed uh, in terms about livelihood and what we want to do with our careers. And, um, and but uh, one thing I really loved about general practice is the holistic nature. And that was in my training job. And mm. I love the fact that I have a pervasive view as to what's going on into a patient's life, okay. which I couldn't appreciate, uh, nor could I uh, really get into in orthopedic surgery. It was very technical, uh, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, broken knee, this is or a broken femur or whatever, or broken thigh bone or whatever. You fix it, this is what you do, and you come out. Whereas in general practice, you really got to relate, empathize, put yourself in the patient's shoes and start thinking, well, if this was my mum or dad, or if this was my brother or sister, mm -hmm. what can I do to try and help alleviate any stress or any, um, any uh, problems they may be facing? And then we pivoted and that was general practice uh, for us. And I trained it. You were for you and your wife. Yeah, so she's also, uh, in fact, she's, uh, she's my partner in life and also partner in crime. Oh, great. So, so we both uh, are a practice called Shakespeare Health Centre in Northwest London, yeah. and we both work there. And, um, and it's good in the sense of um, we work collectively as a team, and we probably have a little bit more tolerance than most partners in terms of our, what's acceptable workload management um, for that reason. But it right. has its downsides too. planning holidays, children yeah. leave and so forth. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, we're, I'm, I'm the co-founder of a, of a company called PopDoc. And um, yeah. one of but my co-founder is also my wife. It was actually my wife's idea for the business. So I, I can completely empathize. There are three co-founders and there's myself, my wife and a, and a third and a third um, academic. But we, we yeah, I can completely empathize. The way I sort of describe it is like when it's good, it's amazing because you're completely on the same wavelength as someone. And then when it becomes difficult, then then sometimes it can be a bit a bit tricky, but broadly massive net positive, because I, I personally, I find that we're both just completely focused on the kind of the mission that we're on. And, you know, you, there's no there's never an issue whereby, oh, you know, why are you working late? Why do you have to do this? Yeah. You know, it, we're, we're on a mission, you know, yeah. we're, we're on a yeah. mission. We're all on the mission. That's it. We, we, you know, we have to get there. So, That's yeah. It. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I did not know that, actually. <laughs> I, I did uh, do a bit of background uh, work on you, and I couldn't relate as to how, how you might be connected to the other co-founder. But, <laughs> but, uh, um, but yeah, no. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I think, it, so you must have encountered that too, right, about holidays, and how do you plan that? And do you talk, always wow. talk shop? Uh, yeah, I, think, the I, table, I, so. I think that's the biggest issue, is actually having, being able to switch off. I think that's the biggest, the biggest one. We don't have any like hard and fast rules, but, but it, it does, you know, work, work at the moment, you know, particularly when you're an entrepreneur bleeds into your life anyway, there's yeah. no, there is no real boundary, um, you know, and, and pretty much on every holiday, one or one of us is working at any particular time, you know, depending upon that type of thing, but it's a passion. I mean, I think that, that speaking to lots of entrepreneurs that have come on the show, pretty much everybody to a, to a person is a mission driven sort of you know entrepreneur and i think that that's what's amazing about working in health tech and it's a real honor and privilege to be in it because you're trying to solve really big problems that, that apply generally speaking to large cohorts of the human population if not the entire human population and so you know it's not like we're trying to i don't know just build a dog food marketplace you know i've got no problems with that like that might be a very valid business to build and that would be very successful but you know we're on a, a different mission so um it, it actually is more inspiring and it's it's easier to try and find the time for something that you're passionate about no i, I totally agree and I, I've, I've got to say at this point that um i think my my wife has been instrumental to where i am today and to where we are today because uh, not only being the pillar of support but it's also like you say it's that encouragement 
uh, when da when days are tough and there's a yeah. number of those days. Yeah, I bet it's there's been a few recently. Yeah. So yeah. It's your, and it's often your spouse you turn to, right? Yeah, so, exactly. And she's like, get back to work. Don't talk to me. What are you doing? No, break over. Right. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> get on with it. Um, yeah. anyway. That type of morale. But no, absolutely. And so, uh, yeah. So after training in Norwich, uh, we had uh, we were told by NHS England that there was a poor performing practice in Northwest right. London. Set on a dilemma, I had been offered a partnership both in Norfolk and Norwich, where I trained, um, yeah. or potentially offered a partnership, I should say, um, or go to Northwest London, where it's a very deprived, very rundown practice, uh, was facing imminent closure. Okay. And um, I said to my wife, shall we try and do something if we can? Mm. and uh famous last words we did yeah. and uh oh it was all hell for the first few years um but what only held us together was our core belief and right. uh I, you, you may have come across the paper written by julian tudor hart about the inverse care law back in yeah. the 1970s and um he had very poignantly very written down effectively is why is health inequality or oh, the mismatch, I should say, of clinical services to patients deprived area was was the thing that really made us think that okay, we could do, we could add value here. Mm. And so we 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 had taken the practice on. We had a quite a massive staff walkout uh, because they weren't they were set in particular ways, and with the ones who stood back thought yeah let's 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 try and do this i'm very very grateful and very appreciative of the team because it couldn't have been possible without a team approach yeah and um and yeah and so and so that was back in 2014 and 2015 right. we not look back so oh, at the time i think you might have just hinted at it it's like oh, oh, at the time when you were starting out you know back in 2013 14 15 um what was the level of like digital sophistication like that you were seeing in none the, in existed the primary care non-existent uh, i mean oh, either that or i was totally oblivious to it but i certainly and i was keen i was on the lookout because we had a workforce issue and we had a workload issue as well right, and i was in, on the lookout for solution as in like workforce too low workload too high correct correct okay. that's correct that's correct so so i was on the lookout for solutions and i struggled i really really struggled but now if you look now i mean it's, it's amazing I mean, yeah the work i mean even medloop uh, the organization no bias of course no. but the work they do um, it's fantastic so cool. and, and like yourself as well what you're doing as well is a bit fantastic um, yeah, near a, patient testing so it's a health tech revolution you know and we're living right in the middle of it so we're going to break now for a couple of minutes just for some adverts from our very very um special um, sponsors of the of the station and then we'll be right back and we're going to talk all about we're going to pick up on that issue around digital transformation and the scaling of digital technology in the primary care system so we'll be right back Hello and welcome back to Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roos. We've got, we're speaking today to Dr. Jay Verma, who is a specialist in um, primary care. He's a practicing GP and in an award-winning GP surgery. 
And he's also the uh, medical advisor to Medloop, which is one of the leading health tech businesses, startups in the UK. So Jay, just before the break, we were talking about the level of digital sophistication that was in the GP system, primary care system, when you sort of started out as a, as a partner. So you said it was very limited, but it's it's changed dramatically since then. Is that right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And so here we have so many novel, innovative, um, very clever, intuitive products out there. And, um, you know, uh, back six, by six, seven years ago, I, I hardly saw any of it. And um, I mean, that's not to say they weren't around, but it certainly wasn't as pervasive as it is now. Um, so any GP, I mean, put it this way, if you look at GP registrars who are just at the tail end of their GP career, as in finishing the vocational training, they're now interested in joining digital health tech. And I would never have seen that when I was training. Right. um it was so uh, unheard of so yeah so it's 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 making huge inroads i think okay and what were the when when back in you know 2014 2015 was it a supply side issue or demand side issue as in there weren't enough companies out there with the services you required or was it that there were companies but there were kind of obstacles and challenges that were kind of insurmountable in terms of getting into the system and actually sort of delivering their products or services out through the, the primary care, the GP system? Oh, yeah, I, 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 think it's, it, I think it's both. And uh, also, to be fair, in primary care, it was never seen as being sexy enough to do more. So in the hospital, right. when I was training in the hospital and when I was doing orthopedic surgery, oh, my gosh, the gadgets they were coming out with, especially right. Stryker, uh, one of the famous uh, um, orthopedic companies that make prosthesis. And the gadgets and tech they had were unbelievable. Coming right. primary care, it was just not seen as being sexy enough and not yeah. enough. But I think it all pivoted when the government announced that they wanted to try and move more care from secondary care into primary care. Right. And that was a huge shift. So I think back then it was, uh, I think it was Tony Blair's government at the time with the Prime Minister Challenge Fund mm. that had come about trying to encourage general practices to become novel and you know form collaborative networks of practices uh, delivering healthcare on mass if you like mm -hmm. and uh, and that, therefore you needed digital tech solutions to try and address that because there was none in existence so the current providers of gp clinical services were very practice based very right. silo based um, right. they weren't even talking well m most of it weren't even talking to each other very well right. um so that was okay. yeah so yeah I think it was both demand and limitation, but that all changed, of course. Yeah, well, we can come on to that in the context of Medloop. So w w uh, w when and how did you start to focus or become interested in or recognize the problems and issues that Medloop solves? Like when, when and, what, and what were they? Like when were they started to kind of pervade your consciousness? Or maybe it was right from the beginning, I don't know. But yeah, t talk us through that. Yeah, okay. So um, just in a nutshell, I'll just explain what Medloop um, uh, does and um, uh, or do uh, uh, at the moment as well. So, so Medloop is effectively a clinical service provider that will assist practices based on a dial-up, dial-down service in order to provide clinical reviews for patients who are not able to get the reviews. And this has become more evident during the pandemic where pa patients were struggling to get into primary care practices. Yeah, and, which, um, which I, I think we all saw that. Yeah, absolutely. So, and that's where Medloop is trying to mitigate that gap by getting reviews done at the patient's uh, place of choice, which might be their home. And okay. um, and so, 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 yeah, so I think, so how it occurred was, in our practice, we were doing the reviews the traditional way, chasing patients, writing to them, texting them, phoning them, getting them to come in. And it was sometimes like incredibly difficult to get patients in the doors. Yeah. We, we, this is without the pandemic, by the way. Yeah. So, um, and, and we realized there were significant inefficiencies in doing so so much time is wasted in administrative processes yeah. and clinician time as well in reviewing lists time and time again to chase patients who just just don't want to come in um, and, what were, and what were some of the reasons why patients would need when you say review review what a review yeah. of what? 
So, sure, sure. So, so most long term conditions would ideally require annual reviews, at least on the minimum, an annual review just to see how the condition is being managed. So they might need medication changes, they might need up titrating or even down titrating, down titrating of their medication. Mm. Um, even in those instances, we would need the patient's engagement, of course, just to speak to them, find out how they're managing the condition, whether the medication they think is working yeah. for them or not. And if not, then thinking of solutions. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is that primary care is very much based on preventative, uh, preventative diseases from becoming worse, if you like, or preventing yeah. from becoming worse, yeah. I should say. And, but when you're well, but you still have the underlying condition. And I say, well, quote, unquote. Yeah. Patients feel they don't need a review. Okay. And so they're more, they, they feel they can manage it um, better themselves or they feel there's nothing to address it. And so they won't engage. Um, that's one, that's a typical example. And what, and, and what kind of long-term conditions? What, what so are the biggest be, long-term conditions? Just so, so the listeners roll up. Yeah, absolutely, that. absolutely. So asthma, um, COPD, diabetes, uh, epilepsy, um, and many of the cardiovascular diseases as well. Like so hypertension, just coronary. Hypertension. Hypertension, like absolutely. Yeah. Hypertension, cardiovascular disease, including a heart failure as well, atrial fibrillation, and so forth. Okay. So and, things that are, things that affect millions and millions of people. Correct, correct, right. correct. And okay. so part of it is that we're trying to address that by education. So we've made attempts at that, just explaining to them. Yes, you might feel well. However, this is mm. what we why we need to address it and optimize the conditions, uh, optimize the medication so your condition is better well managed. And in some cases, it may not be medication, uh, such as in diabetes, as we've seen. Yeah. Papers are coming out. Um, that medications may not be the solution to it all and mm. um, and so it's working with patients on that so that's that's one typical I, area I, I think the really interesting thing here is that I know that when we had our, our, our production call for the show is um, I didn't realize how much work behind the scenes went into prior to services like Medloop but went into organizing to organizing that review so m most patients I guess would they, they see a letter through the door, but they don't really understand all of the administration that has gone on like behind the scenes to try and get that letter out to you and then to follow it up. It's significant, isn't it? Correct, 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 correct. Absolutely. So it's right from looking at the clinical system, generating a list, a clinician reviewing that list, then passing it on to an administrative team member to review the list and send mm. out. And if simple things like telephone numbers aren't updated, or addresses aren't updated, there you yeah. go, you've missed out uh, right. on a review. And um, so, and so, yeah, there is a lot of behind the scenes. And, and I think sometimes they get a uh, unfair share of, um, of rep in the sense that the admin teams can sometimes be perceived as being barriers to patients trying to receive healthcare in and and it's always a, you know, it's a, it's a difficult balance that trying to chase some patients, uh, patients trying to get in with their own agenda or their own needs. So yeah. it can be. Can well, it's, be. I, it's, it's a bit of a thankless task, isn't it? I mean, in, in, yeah. in a way, you know, it's sort of never ending. And I don't know, it's hard to keep everyone happy, I, I would imagine. Right. You know, because I don't know, it, must, it strikes me as a very, very challenging situation. It is, it is, it, it is. But to be fair, the large and the vast majority of patients mean well, and they do, they do. They, and to be fair, our patients, and I'm again, being biased, of course, uh, in our own practice, our patients have been fantastic in engaging with change. Um, and that's despite being, and I admit to this, I'm guilty of this, is poor comps going out to them, explaining about the changes. But they've been so receptive, and uh, and um, and I mean the vast majority have been so receptive to the change, and uh, it was a great testing ground to then trial out the Medloop uh, yeah. platform and service to our patients because I really wanted to know did patients really feel the benefit or not. We will come on to. I'm going to ask one more sure. question, and then I'd like to get you to kind of walk us through, get get you to walk us and myself and the listeners through what how Medloop works from a patient's perspective, but also from a clinician's perspective, because I think it's extremely interesting to look at both. Um, but why, from a clinical perspective, does it matter 
if someone misses a review one year or two okay. years in a row? Like why why does that matter? Yeah. Okay. So um so if we if we set the baseline as the annual review is a minimal review. Right. So what I mean by that is that seeing a patient just once for the long term condition to solely focus on just that long term condition and see whether the patient is or managing is is able to manage the condition well or not, either through with medication or not medication is critical only in the sense of uh, trying to improve uh, longevity, the quality of life. Uh, mm -hmm. patients may have. Um, let, let me give you an example um, of one patient we, we uh, did an annual review on. Uh, a very young, healthy chap, a computer engineer, I think, 24 years of age, was having a repeat prescription of uh, inhalers, uh, blue inhalers, okay. that helps to relieve uh, some of the chest tightness some patients may the have. The Ventolin. That have asthma. Right? Ventolin, that's right, Ventolin. And on a, in the review process, he said that I don't understand why I need to be here. Uh, we went through it. The patient had requested about approximately over 40 to 60 blue inhalers in a year. Wow. And was unfortunately being authorized at different stages. Now, that only became apparent during the annual review because we could focus in on that particular condition and that wow. particular medication. And we said that and, and as you might be aware of, in 2014, the National Review of Asthma, Asthma Deaths had said that anyone receiving more than 12 inhalers in a year should be urgently reviewed. Right. And this guy was having five times the quota, nearly five wow. times the quota. And, and because, because he needed them, he was in need of them. Like he had it. So his asthma thought, was severe enough that. Correct, correct. So he thought that the blue inhaler, because it only works temporarily, it's really a symptom reliever. It's not a yeah. disease modifying drug, or it's not even a, a disease improvement drug, I should call it. And so he was feeling better with taking 60 inhalers a year. But what we had to show him was the evidence and the studies that have shown that if you're taking too many of inhalers, it can actually be more harmful and more dangerous mm -hmm. to you, uh, shortening life expectancy. And, uh, and he understood it. It was a long chat. It was about 30, 40 minute uh, review time. But we walked away knowing that he fully understood what was on board. That, so that imparting that education to patients is so critical in that annual review. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and in that instance, if that chap hadn't had come in, how long do you think it could have gone on with him continuing to blow through 40 to 60 inhalers a year? Would it oh, have continued to get fly under the radar? Correct. What would, um, unfortunately, we had a, a nine-year-old uh, die of asthma, of an asthma attack, uh, I think a year or a year and a half ago in Ealing, I think it was in Northwest London. And when the coroner's inquest looked at it, uh, they could see serial prescriptions or repeat prescriptions of blue inhalers being there. Early warning signs mm -hmm. were there. It, it wasn't, it was being ignored. It was just very hard to decipher that information in a coherent yeah. manner. Yeah. And, uh, and given the workforce shortages and the workload right. increase, it's just compounded to that. And it's very sad to say that, uh, you know, Tragic. children should not, should not should not no. die as a result of this so let's let's go on to um on medloop and walk us through how medloop kind of helps resolve these issues or address these issues because i think as you say i mean there are going to be examples where it can end up in the very tragic circumstances like you say but there are also sort of millions of instances where it, it, it may result in just a significant improvement of quality and life of, of, of right. and so um walk us through medloop from the perspective of a patient and then from a clinician i think that would be great for, for everyone absolutely so i'm um, just uh, just as a preclude um what would ha had happened with medloop uh, about a year ago when i joined um the shashir who's the founder of medloop um we had a very heart-to-heart -heart discussion as what's the purpose for me it had to be more than just working for a health tech firm, it had to be driving change and dri driven based on uh, quantitative outcomes mm. that we can measure. So we know there's tangible results there. Um, and uh, we agreed that we would uh, uh, start with asthma. So we did start with asthma and COPD. And uh, what we wanted to do was just measure the 
in terms of how the review process is occurring. So practices can find benefit uh, from it. But more importantly, we didn't want to be perceived as taking over the practices role of doing annual reviews. Right. That's never been the mission of Medloop. It's right. been there to supplement a uh, resource to the practice. So yeah. and that's why we have a dial up, dial down approach that we work in tandem with the practice. You want 30 reviews? No problem. If you want 150 reviews, no problem. Sure. But always we're there to facilitate uh, the review process within that practice. So all patients uh, are get review um, and right. no patients lose out uh, from, right. from the workload or workforce dilemma. Makes sense. I think it's a, a sort of a pragmatic approach to delivery of, of primary care. Um, but, well, yeah. Yeah, so so the journey time effectively from from the practice point of view, should I mention it or? Is well, it, like, I, I'd like to know, like in an instance, if you you can take asthma, you can take any of the other areas that Medloop focuses on. I'm a patient with that condition. Mm -hmm. What's my interaction with Medloop? Absolutely. So, so effectively, is once a practice has uh, signed up with Medloop to deliver some or part of its reviews or or all of its reviews, whichever then the patient will receive a text message, but it will be perceived as from being from the practice because we're effectively okay. working with the practice on this. A mm -hmm. uh, patient will receive a text message, they would click on a link, and uh, they will be able to then complete uh, a survey, which is more looking at the asthma control test. So let's use asthma, okay. for instance, might be easy. Um, once they're able to uh, complete the data fields in there, they would submit that, that would come over to the Medloops platform called the Patient Management Optimizer. Sounds a bit of a mouthful, but it's quite very, easy to Very use. catchy. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but very easy to navigate through. And it risk stratifies patients based on the asthma control level. And it also risk stratifies based on how many inhalers they're taking. So that example we gave about the inhalers and also about any other UCC or a &E admissions they may have had as well. Once that's all collated, our clinician, um, uh, Claire, she's an absolute amazing nurse. She would then go through the list and give a tailored approach for a review process for the patient. So they would schedule a video chat and um, go through the review process and it would close off. Patients who struggle with the digital tech bit, we have an outreach team who would phone the patients and we would complete the forms on their behalf and then it gets channeled back in to the same flow. Okay, and then from the clinician's perspective, how do they sort of interact with the service? So uh, the clinician from the practice side. Yeah. 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 Um, so effectively, we would then show them the report and showing how many patients we've reviewed, how what the outcomes were of those review processes, and what changes we might be able to recommend to the practice in the internal processes to try and optimize the review will facilitate that review process and we're just recently trying to embark on an educational program where we would be able to share some of the knowledge we've learned from the review process to the practice okay and what from a practice's perspective well you you know because obviously you've got a foot in both camps what do you think are the biggest problems that medloop helps practices solve clinical resource okay which clinical means resource. what oh uh, additional clinical workforce uh, okay. so we have special we have access to specialist uh, respiratory nurses who are doing our asthma reviews and that was something we were very adamant uh, from the get-go that we had to be a respiratory diploma held nurse or respiratory diploma held clinical pharmacist doing mm -hmm. the reviews so we're giving the we're giving better reach and also bespoke tailored approaches for the right. conditions that the patient so, needs a review of so it means the reviews can happen the patients are reached and the actual the, the the expertise involved in the review being done are at the highest possible level while also allowing the gp practitioners in the practice to continue on seeing patients correct that's correct and uh, we've made it such that it's more financially sound for practices so they can use those funds for other clinical resources they might want to have access to right that makes sense well, look, we're going to do, we're, we're going to kind of go to another short commercial break. Um, and after that, we'll come back because I want to dive in a little bit more about what Medloop's doing, what the future holds for Medloop. And I know that there's a whole bunch of other areas within digital technology and healthcare that you're involved in. I'd like to like to hear about some of those. So we will be straight back. Thank you. Yeah, I love 
light is the quantum energy emitted from the universe from the sun and stars. Now, Tom Palladino, a humanitarian and save our life researcher, has created the world's only save our life healing system, a system that can bring long distance healing and wellness to humans, pets, and plants via a photograph. Get your free 15 day trial now at saveourlife.com. This is the Save Our Life Network on the UK Talk Radio website. natural ability to support gut strength all year long, so your immune system can protect you when you need it the most. Treating your inner arm. <clears throat> Visit ionbio.com to learn more. Ion Gut. Protect what protects you. Hi, welcome back to the final part of this week's Health Tech Hour with me, Steve Roost, and Dr. Jay Verma, digital transformation expert, GP practitioner, award winner, and medical advisor to Medloop. So, Jay, um, just before the just before we broke for the commercials, we were talking about how Medloop addresses some of the clinical resource issues within primary care, which which makes total sense. So, how um, do you have any sort of um, uh, information that you can share around? How much time it saves or, or what kind of impact it can have on a on a on a practice level in kind of real real terms to, to demonstrate how successful it, it can be absolutely absolutely so um it, it might help if i go through what a standard baseline process is first yes and then explain where medloop slots in and what it can address so traditionally, what would normally happen in general practice, as we briefly uh, discussed earlier on, is uh, a list is generated, clinician would review, pass that list on to the administrative staff who would then go and contact the uh, patients. And then the patients would then be booked in for a face-to-face -face review if they want to turn up or if they do turn up. And then that review process itself would take between about uh, typically between 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, some practices average about 20 minutes or so. Uh, the review is done, uh, post administrative work is needed, like issuing a care plan, which is tailored uh, a, a plan for the patient on how to manage their condition, uh, should it get worse and um, over the course of the year, and then the next review is done the following year. Uh, uh, and, and that's traditionally what would happen as a baseline. In terms about where Medloop would slot in, uh, Medloop, uh, the practice would say, right, I've got my asthma patients, and they would say, sort them out. We say, fine. We would uh, give them, of course, uh, by complying with GDPR, we'd ask them to look at our data processing agreement. They would review that if they're sat uh, satisfied and majority have been, there's not, nothing controversial in there. They would then sign that over and allow our clinician to have a remote instance into the clinical system. And we would download the list and upload it into the PMO. And, yeah. uh, and that would help us sort out the list in terms of um, uh, how we contact them. So those who have a mobile number will get sent an SMS link. Those who don't have a mobile number but have a landline number, a, a member of our outreach team would contact them to help them complete the survey. Um, or we would ask them if they would like, we can update the mobile number and then they can complete it themselves if they so wish to do so. But more importantly, we've also clicked on to about the digital exclusion uh, uh, population as well. So those patients who may have certain disabilities, especially like learning disability, who would struggle to complete the review process, um, we would we would speak to the practices thinking that it might be better for a face-to-face -face review and pass that on. Um, but you might also have some patients who've got very bad rheumatoid arthritis who can't uh, use the phone well, or we can't right. use the keyboard well. So again, our member of the outreach team would complete the form on their behalf, mm -hmm. and uh, and that gets slot back into our clinician. Once yep. all the reviews are, once all the um, review process, the initial review process is done, that's the screening questionnaire completed. They're risk stratified. They're put onto the management system, and uh, and then the clinician will sort them through. Our review time is actually around about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, so we've 50% reduced the re review 
portion from what a traditional uh, practice would normally undertake that review. The administrative time as well, that's also been slashed right down. So practices wouldn't have to worry about that because it's all automated in the PMO. Mm -hmm. um, so it's literally like a one click button that will right. send out a mass SMS to these patients who have asthma, um, right. asking them to complete the survey. And, um, and so that administrative time is saved and also the clinician time is saved. So all in all, traditionally, um, and I, I'm sure Medic wouldn't mind confidentially uh, sharing this information. Just us, it's just me and the listeners. It's just me and like, you know, <laughs> no. and I, th I think they'll be all right. So a traditional review could cost potentially a practice between 17 to 20 pounds for a uh, standard, uh, sorry, so for a non-specialized asthma nurse doing the review. Mm. We've managed to bring the cost down from a, a respiratory specialist nurse doing the review, and we brought it down to about 10 pounds a review. Wow, that's a massive reduction. Yeah, and it's mainly because of a lot of the tech and the time uh, yeah. we save on that side. So, um, so yeah. So, so time cost, because what we believe in is, is that money can be reinvested in the practice domain for other clinical resources. And that's where we'd love to do add more value to it if we can. Yeah. And um, I think that makes that makes total sense. And what what I mean, what if anything are there sort of what are the obstacles or the challenges that you're facing? Because if you compare it to the current practice of, you know, compiling the list, clinician looks through the list passes the list to the admin staff. The admin staff send things out, hound people, chase people, try to get people into the surgery. It, it seems like a no brainer, but I know things aren't always that simple, particularly not in the NHS. So like, what, what, what are, what are the, the biggest sort of headwinds, if you like, with, with the scaling of this? I reckon it's the lag time between each of those processes. So then this is where Medloop adds advantage to it. The lag time, what I mean by that is people deprioritizing what work needs to be done. Okay. And it's really interesting. I saw this the other day with my own uh, practice manager and bless him, he's brilliant. And um, what I was thinking was very urgent priority and I didn't state it to him was mediocre priority. Okay. And so that would cause a lag time. That means, and if you think about it in the grand context of things, if it's a week or two weeks, that's a week or two weeks delayed for that person to have the review. Yeah. So, and that's where Medloop tool, hopefully once the list is uploaded, sent out, it's done. It's, right. it's all done within five minutes. There is no need for different individuals in place. So the barriers that you were asking me earlier on, I see is the, and it's not, I don't want to call it human barriers. It's not human that are causing the barriers. It's the yeah. workload that they're pressed upon them is causing them to deprioritize certain urgent tasks. Right. And um, that's what we want to try and address and mitigate. Right. I think that that makes, that makes total sense. And so um, what does the next sort of 12 months look like for Medloop? And then I want to kind of touch on some other things that you're doing with the Health Foundation, for example. Yeah. But what's the next kind of 12 to 18 months look like for you guys at Medloop? Yeah, so we're looking at diabetes. <laughs> and diabetes is a mammoth task. So, but I think, I think, I think it's, it's a nutshell and we're very keen to work with a provider who can provide near patient testing. So I want right. to talk to you. And because what we are needing to do where I remember in 2016, when we were asked about trying to improve diabetes care in our own practice, um, we were very fortunate that a pharma company, I think it was Sanofi who had uh, allowed us to use the DCA analyzer machine we were able to increase our attendance of patients into our clinics by, oh, I can't remember the exact percentage, but it was certainly over 200%, only because patients didn't have to go to the hospital for a blood test, then yeah. come and see us. They yeah. came to one clinic, one stop shop, foot check, urine an analysis, HbA1c, red. Within 20 yeah. minutes, we had a decision made for the patient how best to manage yeah. it and review them next. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. I mean, that's why we started PopDoc for exactly that reason was to allow people to get themselves tested or test themselves as quickly as possible in non, you know, outside of the standard pathology lab pathway. You know, that's I, so yeah, that makes total sense. 
Okay. So yeah, diabetes and also we're doing unplanned care as well. So um, a lot of practices have been saying to us that they're struggling with appointments, offering GP appointments. So we've just started to cater for um, appointments to be available for GP practices. So they may say, we'd like to purchase 10 appointments from you. Uh, I don't, well, 10 is a bit too small, but usually it's about 300 appointments a week. Yeah. Um, we need of GP appointments. We say, not a problem they would then purchase 300 GP appointments. So that's also reducing the workload for mm. practices and hopefully um, mitigate, addressing the clinical resource uh, issue as well. So we're looking to that. And we're mainly trying to do that so we can make the planned care, which is the annual reviews, a little yeah. bit easier for practices. So, yeah. so we're trying on all fronts if we can yeah, to so try and help in, practices. Increase the efficiency around things that you can plan for so that that then allows more capacity in the system to treat things that you can't to deal with things that you can't plan for correct that's exactly it correct cool well yeah it sounds exciting so talk to us about the the health foundation because when we had our call our, our production call i thought that that was fascinating so why don't you can t t tell us about what you're doing with the with the health foundation yeah so um it's um <laughs> when i do get some spare time i'm working uh with a uh, very close uh by practice um and we were looking in particular with asthma care, which is what led me to work uh, for Medloop. Um, but in more in particular, what we have so many dashboards available. And if I hear the word one more time, I, I think <laughs> I'm going to break down in a minute. Um, it's only because dashboards are great, but there are very silo entities that are very static. And you know that child I mentioned earlier on, the nine year old who had yeah. the um, who unfortunately had died. Would you believe it if there was a dashboard that was flagging that patient up for uh, for for intervention, but no one had looked at the dashboard? Is that right? Yeah, and the oh, sad thing so is, sad. That, and that's what made us think, no, it, there's got to be more to dashboards. Computer has to be cleverer, so and they are. So with machine learning, what we're looking at is that is could we train algorithms to identify them forward and push them rather than it being like a pool system where mm. I'm pulling the system out of the database, could we push these out to clinicians and recommend changes or recommend treatment options for them? And so about, I think about a year and a half ago, we were awarded the grant from the Health Foundation to look at machine learning and trying to tackle this problem head on. And I would, I would love to, um, you know, if Medloop decides that this is an avenue they would want to look into, is start to embellish this in the, in, in the review process to assist yeah. clinicians. So again, it's not to replace, it's mainly to assist. No. And, no. Uh, well, I think that that's part of why, you know, one of the, one of the reasons why digital technology is, is required at this point is because you, you literally cannot replicate GPs that's the problem like that, that is the fundamental issue that we're dealing with you, you can't replicate healthcare staff at a sufficiently quick enough rate to, to cope with the demand and on, on, on the system and so how do we use technology to address what can be addressed using technology without Correct. you know without sacrificing any quality of care Correct. um but it, it's not about re replacement and if anything it's it's about helping people work well this is how i think about it anyway i agree, about I help, agree. helping people work to the top of their grade all the time so that we increase the efficiency throughout the entire system no i i totally agree with you i so agree with you and it, it's also about augmenting the clinician my dream and uh, i don't want to sound like martin luther king here but <laughs> because his was way more powerful than what i'm about to say yeah, but yeah. my dream is effectively is that i'm just able to have a chat and empathize with a patient all the clinical decisions and all that stuff is being done by the computer. Okay. And uh, and I know some of my GP colleagues think I'm gone balmy, and I probably have, you know, to be honest. But effectively, what I'm trying to say is, I just want to relate to human to human in the consultation. Say, right, what can I do to help? And all the clinical issues, because I, I reflect on the ten minute consultation times I have, and I'm so honed in on making sure I ask all the right questions. I've covered yeah. myself, I've got this red flags covered, I've safety netted well, that I'm failing to try and engage with the patient to patient level and say, yeah. well, okay, how's that making you feel? What can we do extra? So yeah, I think that's really powerful. You know, the human to human aspect. I think it's how that gets resolved in a in a time crunched 
you know system i think is 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 critical right because that's one of the most amazing things about the primary care system is is the ability that you have to relate to your patients who you see all the time you know yeah um so how um what i know that we also talked about community-based care and i know that you're a big proponent for community-based care and so how, how would you define community-based care and why do you feel like it's it's a potential or one of many potential solutions to the to the stress on the primary care system so i think unless we all work together on this i don't think we'll ever be able to solve it and when i say all together i'm talking about practices pharmacies local uh, programs, local voluntary organizations that are in the area as well. And it's helping reducing, it's helping them to reduce their workload issues. Only can then collectively, can we make patient impact change? And uh, some of the examples are more about education. I mean, there's a, there's a fantastic guy by the name of David Bruff who works in Hayton Harlington. And I can't believe, he, I think, I'm not going to actually I'm, I'm not going to go near his age because I'm not no, sure. Don't do that. <laughs> but he has got so much energy um, and so much uh, uh, so much charisma in trying to improve community care. And I just said that we've got to work together on this, that let me try and help the technical, medical, all that stuff. If you can engage patients, because once you've got the engagement tackle, mm. then you, you're on to a winner. Because the rest, I personally think it's hard work, but it's easy, if that makes mm. sense. But the engagement part is so essential. And that's community based care is that everyone's pulling their weight effectively yeah. and driving that holistic change. I completely agree with you. I think the community has an ability to relate to people and communicate things in an efficient, um, direct human way that larger organizations, larger systems just won't be able to. And if it can come together, um, the, 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 all of those institutions are in effect pillars of those communities you know people are familiar with them people like going to them people have been going to them for years they trust the people that work there if there's a way to make those things um, play more of a front line in delivery of services i think that could be a major solution to what we are to, to, to the system yeah, i totally agree because I, I guess in a way we're we're just part of the jigsaw right yeah um <laughs> so yeah it's just about bringing that stuff together so Jay, Dr. Jay Verma, thank you very much for coming on the show. That's all we've got time for. It was brilliant to have you on and give your insights both as a GP practitioner and as medical advisor to Medloop. And um, yeah, thank you very much for coming on. Oh, no, thank you for having me. It's been great fun talking uh, here as well. Good. And thank you to everyone for listening. And we'll be back next week with another fantastic guest. Thank you. Great.